Dr. Michael Chi is Professor and Director of the Center for Cognitive Neuroscience, Duke and U.S. Graduate Medical School, and a Singapore Translational Research Investigator. He graduated from the National University of Singapore with a degree in medicine and trained in internal medicine and neurology before embarking on subspecialty training at the Cleveland Clinic. After completing his training and practicing for a few years, he decided to venture into functional magnetic resonance imaging, spending a short time at the Massachusetts General Hospital NMR Center in Boston. He was so enthused by his experience that after returning to Singapore, he decided to devote most of his working time to scientific investigation. His early work on the bilingual brain was fruitful, but a lifelong fascination with improving cognitive performance led him to study the neurobehavioral effects of sleep deprivation. At what point in your career did you decide to become an investigator? Well, like most professional scientists, I've, um, I have a very high level of curiosity and um, I will ask questions about pretty much anything and get, you know, I can develop an interest um, pretty much any topic. I grew up in the 1960s at a time uh, when um, this was the dawn of the um, space age and also um, the beginning of the consumer electronics era. So the physical sciences were very big and um, you know, part of this, the overall scheme of physical sciences is physics, physical chemistry and math. I was very enchanted by these disciplines because of the rigor they had when I went on my two-year fellowship to the Cleveland Clinic, uh, I, I had an exposure to how uh, medicine could be conducted in a very scientific manner. Uh, my mentor, um, the electrophysiologist Hans Luders, um, was a quintessential German uh, you know, scientist, doctor. He was very precise. Um, he was uh, very thoughtful in the way he approached uh, medical and scientific issues. And he was very exacting in his demands and his writing. And, you know, I learned a great deal about that. His exposure to him was another contributing factor to my decision to pursue research later. The other thing that happened during that fellowship was I became exposed to magnetic resonance imaging. And um, very quickly I recognized that this was something that I would use as a major tool in my future career. The spring of 1995 was a period where fMRI had just come out of the um, physicist realm into uh, the realm of cognitive neuroscience. At that time, you know, I, was a, I was a medical doctor. I didn't know anything about cognitive neuroscience. I was interested in, in primarily disease. But there was something about this fMRI that attracted me. And um, when the opportunity came up to uh, join this course um, at the Massachusetts General Hospital led by Robert Savoy, I didn't have to be asked twice. I think life was never the same after that. At the point you made your decision, how adequate did you feel? In a nutshell, I was pretty crazy at the time. Um, when, I, when I got back from Boston, I was really amped up. What was helpful was that um, people from Singapore General Hospital, Eddie Jacob, Wu Keng Tai and Charles Zung provided some respite through their support. And uh, this enabled me to get by and um, it enabled me to do the necessary to get my lab into orbit. Well, I rose to the challenge with, uh, I think, an incredible mix of naivete, bravado, and creativity. Um, the first um, work that was generated from my Singapore lab was on English-Chinese bilingualism. And I, I was really blessed. Uh, we hit a home run with that work. Um, and, you know, as they say, the, the, the rest of history really opened doors for me. What were the challenges that you faced in the earlier part of your career? I think I can summarize it by saying there were three major challenges. First were the um, political obstacles. Secondly was the challenge of um, getting uh, the lab started from scratch. And the third one was um, selecting good partners. Political obstacles. I think um, I was interested in a field uh, which was staked out by radiologists. I was a neurologist and the radiologists at the time uh, felt that I would be encroaching on their turf if I, if I were to do MR-based research. In fact, I was told uh, several times that if I, if I continued on, on this track, you know, I would face significant obstacles. 
Fortunately, um, you know, as a result of, of being perhaps blind to this because of, of my curiosity and just my nature, I, um, I found ways of working around this. The second major challenge was building the, uh, the scientific uh, fund of knowledge and the, uh, the, ne the, the network required to succeed. I hadn't any formal scientific training in, in linguistics. I hadn't been to traditional grad school. So uh, developing the knowledge base that would support the work required me to pull out all the, all the tricks that I developed while uh, mining for information with those mathematical puzzles. The third thing was finding um, and building good partnerships. Um, after the initial successes uh, of the lab, you know, people wanted to ride on our coattails. But I had a simple rule with it, which I still stick to, and that is um, any collaborator has to be uh, emotionally committed to the project. I think this is very critical because whenever, there, uh, whenever there's an asymmetry in commitment, eventually things sour up. So I, I have a very heart-to-heart -heart, uh, talk with, with collaborators and, and convince them that this is a really key thing to making collaborations work. How have the challenges you faced evolved as you rose through the ranks? Well, I would say that um, when I started, the challenges were largely organisational. But as I moved along, um, the technical demands of conducting research have grown considerably. Um, I was fortunate to catch the rising wave. Uh, the technical demands make it much more difficult for a new entrant to conduct uh, cognitive neuroscience research. However, I would, I would um, advise uh, you know, the young entrants is that although technical um, mastery gives you bragging rights. The, the most important thing for um, good science is to be able to answer, uh, think of a, a good question and to design experiments that answer that question within the, the limits of your, um, the skills you have as well as the best personnel you can muster at that given time. I think if you stick to this, um, you know, you don't go wrong. The challenge is that you can't afford to rest on your laurels. You keep you have to keep reinventing yourself and to be very self-critical. I think if, you, if you're, you're committed to doing this, um, you'll be fine. And so far, I've, I've done okay. How did you cope with these challenges and who or what served as your reference point? I think when I started, I was wildly enthusiastic. But the downside of this was that I rode an emotional roller coaster. Over time, I learned the enduring truth that um, what doesn't kill you will make you stronger. Um, and if you believe in, that you can find solutions, you, you will find them. Um, it also uh, helped to have a, a good um, bank of uh, biographical information. I love trawling through biographies and you, and you learn from others how they, um, and how, how they face their problems and um, dealt with them. I've also been fortunate uh, that my family has always been, been very supportive of my efforts in science. Um, also, I don't talk about it much, but my faith has contributed a lot. It's been a pillar in, in the difficult times. I will say that at the end of the day, uh, being a principal investigator can be extremely lonely and you have to be willing to gut it out during those tough times. What scientific work are you most proud of? Well, um, the work I did on English-Chinese bilingualism remains well cited despite the fact that I've left that area uh, for many years. I spent about six to seven years working on language and um, it, it was a period of um, great learning. I've always uh, been mindful uh, of the fact that at the end of your as a scientist's career, people look, at, look back and, and they ask two things, you know. Did this person work, did the person's work tell a story and did that story count for anything? So sleep deprivation is, is very pervasive and it, it does uh, result in, in deficits in, in performance. I'm particularly proud over the last few years of developing a theoretical framework to explain some of these behavioral changes that we observed um, when a person is sleep deprived. This framework enables us to explain um, the results of several experiments. I'm happy to have contributed to this. Um, the other thing that um, I think I have to reserve the last word for is uh, the supporting cast. Um, Unless you're a mathematician, uh, 
no one can uh, conduct research without um, you know being part of a team. I must say I'm very proud of being having been able to attract um, a group of you know talented, motivated scientists over the years uh, to be involved in their training, their grooming, and uh, you know um, their later uh, development as independent investigators in their own right. I think this this completes the the circle and. And um, it, it is something that I'm proud to leave as a, as a legacy. Who uh, were or are some of the more memorable collaborators or, or partners you've had? Well, looking back the memory bank, um, David Kaplan, who is a noted language researcher from Harvard, he provided very balanced advice, professional advice. Um, I remember uh, Denise Park, who um, works on ageing, she was really fun to work with. She was, she was really enthusiastic. She, I met her at a meeting in the US. Within a month, she flew to Singapore uh, with a team. We had discussions and in 10 months, um, we had a paper in Journal of Neuroscience. I mean, that was incredible. David Dinges from University of Pennsylvania, um, a noted um, sleep researcher for his, um, his incredible focus. I mean, he does work on, on lapses in attention and vigilance, and he does not lapse. Um, he, he impressed me with his work rate, his total devotion and commitment to the cause, and his discipline. I mean, he is, is um, a great example of what it takes to excel at the, the very top levels of our field. Um, I enjoyed working with Scott Hutel and Alan Song, my colleagues in Duke, who, who provided opportunities to um, have tremendous exchanges in the field of decision making. And finally, Vitaly Zakharanov, um, a Russian married to a Singaporean, who um, I enjoyed interacting with. He taught me all the math that I missed in high school. What gives you the buzz to continue what you're doing? First, I, I'm, I really love the scientific process, uh, the process of inquiry, the ability to, um, you know, to explore uh, knowledge, to find the answers to questions that, that, you know, that wake you up in the middle of the night. Um, specific to what I do um, in, in my specific research arena, I'm very, very convinced that sleep loss um, will continue and will evolve as a major uh, risk factor for human health and well-being. And our conversion into a 27-hour, 24-7 uh, world is, is um, you know, makes this all the more important. Also, I think it's one of the tractable risk factors that we can uh, that will grow in in importance. A lot of the major uh, threats to health and well-being are now lifestyle factors, and you know I think this is it's very important to give back um, and inform society, tell them you know what we've found and why this is relevant, why they you know why they should think or of or modify their lives accordingly. Um, Lastly, I think I'm really fascinated by you know, what works and doesn't in, in terms of communi communicating ideas. So, I mean, just, the, just this shoot is, is an example of you know, trying out different ways of reaching out to the community and figuring out what works. In retrospect, what would you change if you could go back in time? Hmm, I love reminiscing. But I don't exactly fancy counterfactual thinking, thinking about, you know, what what if I did this or that? I will say that um, being able to face your mistakes squarely, to, to confront them, to figure out what you should do and then to move on is, is uh, critical. I also think that uh, being able to forgive and to move on has helped me retain you know, that childlike curiosity that's so essential uh, you know, to being a scientist. So we've come back full circle, really. Um, you know, the curiosity, the willingness, and ability to ask questions, and you know, being willing to go that extra mile to answer your question. I think these lie at the core of you know, every scientist. And uh, while we may have our moments, I honestly will say that um, I wouldn't have it any other way. I love what I do and I hope I, I can continue doing this for as long as I am able to.